So, hello. It's really nice to be here. My name is Stefan, and I'm working on a startup with my co-founder, Marcus. So a year, a year ago, we were drawing straws, and I drew the shorter one. So now I'm the one who gets woken up by PagerDuty every night. So I did a 25-minute version of the meaning of words at JSConf EU last year. It was the first time I gave this talk. And to me, it was the first time I showed something that I really cared about. So I didn't know how people would react to it. So after day one, I talked to friends, I met some new people, and I got great feedback, such as this. Your talk was great. It made me realize how shitty everything is. <laughs> so I know it sounds evil, but it made me so happy that it made him sad. Because the point of my talk is to make people realize just because things are the way they are doesn't mean we can't do any better. So a while after JSConf EU, Stefan Bennemann got in touch. Hey, you're speaking at Concat. Oh, yeah. Finally, I can just do a talk I've done before without all the dreadful stress and anxiety of preparing something. Oh. Can you make it twice as long? <sighs> Luckily enough, there are many other broken things I can talk about. The meaning of words, special extended edition, edition with extra despair on top. <laughs> Let us descend into madness. So when we're building things, just about everyone is focused on the end result. How will it look like? How's the user experience? And does the code have semicolons? But it's not just important what we build. It's also important how we build it. So what's the how in programming? And the how in programming is the product, mathematical product, of the people we work with and the tools we use. And by tools, I mean your computer, all the other computers, commonly referred to as the cloud, uh, your build tool, your deployment tool, your monitoring, like everything, et cetera. And the problem is that the how evolves slower than the what, because startups and businesses are less likely to tackle developer tooling. And the reason for that is because the market for that is way smaller than the market for consumer apps, of course. Um, so therefore, most tools we're using on a daily basis are being created as open source projects in people's free time. So that's why I think we need a sandbox for the how, uh, a place where ex experimentation is natural and completely free and effortless. We need something that is so good at the what it can also change the how. But before we get into that, I'm obviously very excited about it, and I want to share that excitement with everyone. But nothing really matters more than human interaction with other humans. And those are way too pretty words for describing how fucked our industry is. So I implore you to attend Lina's a talk about nothing this evening at 6.10. So now we go to that slide. So how do we know what's actually broken? What, how do we know what to work on? Maybe we know what bothers us at the moment, but we don't really know what to do about it, like how to fix it. So we need a, I think we need a process to help us identify the problems we're unaware of. We need an abstract, easy to understand concept, something that's good enough, good enough so we can ask ourselves again and again, and we always get a helpful answer. We need a principle. Creators need an immediate connection to what they're creating. And this is Brad Victor's guiding principle. And I'll show you some ideas following his principle to give you an idea about what he's talking about there. So on the left side, we have an editor. Oh, sorry. <laughs> on the right side, we have an editor. On the left side, we're showing the picture the code generates. And the, the editor allows direct manipulation of values. Changing a value on the right gets us immediate results on the left, and there is no compilation or any other sort of weighting involved. Everything happens instantly. So Brett thinks this immediate connection is very important. You can't do certain things if the computer makes you wait all the time, and I really agree with that.
So do we have an immediate connection to what we're creating in JavaScript? No, I don't think so. I think this principle is often violated. There are many things which are disconnecting us from the creative process. So to find out more about that, for the last week, I wrote down things that went wrong in our development process. So I'm in a project where I'm helping people with setting up their infrastructure and figuring out like development workflows. Some people were very new to it, and some already had some experience in certain areas. Monday, dear diary, I saw on the screen in our project room that the app is down. I was confused because the CI server said there were no failing tests. After investigating for an hour, I found out that not only there were no failing tests, but no tests were being run at all. Okay. So the integration tests really should have ran before the continuous integration build. And the problem is that that is not possible because the build isn't quick enough. The build must be fast enough so we can always run the tests after every change we make. Also, like seriously, if your test runner says zero tests run, zero failures, it should obviously be a red flag. Um, and the actual problem was that non-zero exit codes should be an error for the test runner, which they weren't, so I had to fix that in some other ugly, hacky way. Anyway, next day. Hey, diary. Oh, wow, another version of IOJS. So amazing. But someone on the team was still running no 0.10. They couldn't work on master anymore because we were using V8 feature, features that didn't exist in Node yet. So I fixed things in their terminal via screen sharing. The Wi-Fi dropped a few times, but we updated it without breaking other stuff in an hour or so. So I, I think the dev envir environment is not isolated enough. Like, why do people have to manually go in there and like install a new version of something? Why isn't this part of the project already? And they just have to pull and then get the change. And apart from that, there's like way too many other steps that are manual and that really could be automated, but like it would be really expensive to do so. Okay, new diary entry. Wednesday, oh hey diary. I required capital B Bluebird instead of lowercase b Bluebird in a module. It worked on my Mac, but the CI build failed. Of course, HFS, like the file system on Mac OS, is usually case insensitive, so the case doesn't matter in that case, but that won't work on Linux. So my conclusions for Wednesday were, the file system is trolling me. Why is this happening? And also, honestly, the computer could have told me that Bluebird is not a package that exists in, on NPM. Okay, last entry, diary. We needed to rename an app. Long story short, it took three people coordinating, coordinating changes on GitHub, Heroku, and Travis. At the end of the day, it worked, but it required lots of communication. And in the evening, someone pushed a dead branch to GitHub. <laughs> Who said that happened to them? <laughs> yeah, quite a few people, I reckon. So I think things shouldn't break when names change. Names are for humans, not for computers. Right? Names are there so we know what we're talking about and so we can reference things and communicate with each other. And branches, you know, branches are great, but they require lots of manual grooming. Like I realized that when I was teaching a GitHub workflow to the team, basically it was like, it was really awkward. It was like, oh yeah, and then I merge a pull request and every one of you need to remove the branch from your local working copy. Like, you know, I was thinking, why do I have to tell them that? Like, why doesn't it happen automatically? Okay, so far so good. Who or what is responsible for this? So when something goes wrong, we shouldn't blame the person who made a mistake, I think. There's always something you could have done to prevent it. I think if we ever want to have a chance to change the current state we, we're in, we need to set our sights on different suspects. Maybe those guys. So. Unix source. Unix is the opium of the people. I think Karl Marx totally said that, or he would have said it. So in The Art of Unix Programming by Eric S. Raymonds, he describes 17 design rules of Unix in his book. And I'm going to show you three of those rules. Developers should build a program out of simple parts 
connected by well-defined interfaces. So problems are local, and parts of the program can be replaced in future versions to support new features. That's the rule of modularity. I think we're doing pretty well in JS here. We got module systems and package managers. We didn't have that five years ago, really. Um, and packages with matching interfaces can just be replaced, right? Like, for example, if you have some kind of express middleware which isn't being maintained anymore sometimes, you can drop in another one, which is uh, the replacement for that. Another rule, um, the rule of composition. And developers should write programs that can communicate easily with other programs. This rule aims to allow developers to break down projects into small, simple programs rather than overly complex, monolithic programs. I think this is also like, you know, covered pretty well in JS. Like, it's possible um, to do that. Because any package can require any other package. There's no restrictions unless they want to require each other, which is kind of sad if you think about it. And a package can export one or multiple things, right? So it's up to the maintainer of the package how the interface looks like. The third rule, and the last rule, is the rule of simplicity. Developers should design for simplicity by looking for ways to break up progr program systems into small, straightforward, cooperating pieces. Again, nothing in JS that prevents us from doing that. We can start with one package or module and split it down, if necessary, on a need-to-need -need basis. But not everything is great about Unix. Like, I'm not actually going to quote from this book, I just thought the cover was kind of funny. Um, Unix has a really steep learning curve. Like when people, especially young people, start out, they just want to learn how to program, like how to make those pretty things. Like, I, rem I recently gave a, gave a talk um, at the company I'm uh, contracting for, and I explained the experience of my dad teaching me the, my first line of QBasic. It was nothing but print line something, something, something in this blue editor window, and you could like run it, and then it would appear as a gray on black thing on the screen, like a real program. And just realizing that I could write a program such as this, basically, you know, that was the start of my path. And I couldn't really um, get off that path, even if I wanted to, <laughs> sometimes. Um, cool, so here's a retweet from a, from a protected account. I made use all, and I want to make a start about chinchillas. First, install Grunt. Like, that's ridiculous. I'm not blaming Grunt here. Don't get me wrong. Uh, but maybe it's easier for people who are more experienced in computer systems, like Joe Armstrong, who is the inventor of Erlang. Holy shit, he just installed Grunt on the 29th at 2.50 p.m. Five minutes later, he's having problems. <laughs> so, and then the next day, he just gave up. <laughs> I can understand that. Okay. The next horse, the file system. Nested directory structures tend to be contrived. You know, for me, it's kind of like a, when I started out learning object-oriented programming. I had this big, fat C++ book for some reason. Um, people kept trying to tell me how to build those class taxonomies of things, like a car is a vehicle, but it's not a garage. Obviously. Um, <laughs> so you'll change your mind about how you organize things, and that includes where you put files. Right, like everyone, like I guess everyone has a Dropbox account or something similar. Like, have you ever had this experience? You put everything in a certain way, but then you disagree with that a month later and you change everything again? Yeah. So you're really reluctant to move things, uh, things around because it's a pain in the ass. So that is because, you know, a file can only be in one place. It can be in multiple places. Symlinks can help you with that, but you can't use them in code repositories. Like we've tried, but it's a pretty bad idea to check a symlink into a Git repository, um, I've learned. Like people don't react well to that. And I think it didn't work on Windows either, so don't do it. Um, yeah, so what happens when moving files, right? A file is referenced not just by its name, but it's by its entire path, right? So if you move it, you're changing the link. So anything that's linking to that is now broken. 
on the web, we already know that you should never do that. You should not break links. If you break a link, you put something in its place so it redirects to the new destination. Okay, and then talking about the cloud, right? Like, what's the file system's relationship with the cloud? Whatever that means. Uh, we don't really open and edit files on our smartphone, do we? Like, if I open an app, it never asks me to select a directory I want to open and then find files. It's just a linear list of things. Maybe I can organize things around, but basically it's something which is not the file system, it's some, something on top of it. And this is also happening to our desktop computers. You know, I, I can just create stuff, change stuff in some apps, and I can just close them, and I never have to save anything because it's already synced somewhere. Um, and in conclusion, that means we don't have to worry as much about losing stuff anymore, right? We kind of trust the computer, like, you're going to take care of this. If I create a keynote presentation, which I should have done, but I writ, write, wrote my own slideshow framework, um, and then I put it in the iCloud Drive folder, um, I know that it's probably not going to disappear unless something goes wrong with iCloud, which happens a lot, but you know. Okay, next third horse, the terminal, my old friend. Uh, this is an IBM 2250 Model 4. I was basically looking like for, for the oldest uh, possible first digital non-punch card terminal. So that is from 1964, and it was $280,000 for the entire system. Okay, so I, I was looking for the next thing, the DAC VT100. And you know, if you look into Linux source code, it still says VT100 all over the place because it's basically emulating that. So this has been released in 78, 14 years later than anything before, which seems like a long time. It's probably much better, but I can't, can't tell the difference. It just looks old to me. So what's the terminal today? It's still a duplex text communication interface, right? Like you send stuff to the computer, the computer sends stuff to you, and uh, you have to read stuff. You have to write stuff in a way the computer understands it. But now it has pretty colors and emojis, right? Because we got Unicode. So what we're doing now is we're basically making it prettier. Like if you have some kind of test runner, for example, like tap, uh, tape, it has this ugly machine readable output and then there's another Unix command and you can pipe tap output into it and then you get like nice colors and everything. Um, so we don't really evolve the terminal any, anymore, but we firmly hold on to it. Another friend of mine is shell scripting, right? I think it's way too easy to make mistakes when writing a shell script. Like, what happens if you have an accidental extra space somewhere? What could possibly go wrong? For example, it, le it deletes your entire user directory. So I really empathize with the author of this project because I've totally killed my own home dear in the past, but not other people's home dears. So instead of removing something within the user local directory, the, skip, the script removed all of user. And it's just really silly, I think. <laughs> so after this, we surely learned our lesson and everything, everyone got way more careful, right? No. So basically, for a certain period of time, when you updated your Steam client, which is a game library, it deleted everything that was owned by the user. Oh well. Uh, but you should have made a backup. I'm sure you've heard it. Maybe you said it yourself. For me, you should have done X is a pattern. It's a sign of something being wrong. Something the computer sh should take care of because that's what the computers are good for. Those easy to forget things we humans suck at. Anyway, uh, I think the file system is not going to change, right? It's not like in a year or something going to turn into a magical database with versioning and immutability and whatnot. Just like email, file systems won't change until the end of the world. They'll just stay as the way they are because they support everything else. But maybe that doesn't even matter. Okay. The question is then really, because the file system doesn't change, what do we build on, on top of it? What I want to tell you is, I don't think that the file system is like fertile ground for storing code, 
okay? Like, not even your working copy. I think instead we must build something which is more intelligent, like something which we can shape to our own needs and not something we have to like recursively traverse through in order to get all the files within a certain directory. Like, that doesn't make any sense. I just want to say, give me all the code in this project, right? Basically a database query, and then it should be done with that. Cool. Last words, ourselves, yours truly. We get defensive when we're faced with novel ideas. This, is, this has always worked for me. What you're suggesting is wrong. Um, experimentation is really being actively discouraged. Like I remember when I picked up PHP 10-ish years ago, I was trying to write an IRC bot for some reason with PHP, and people really didn't like that idea. They were like, you should only, you should only use PHP for backend form processing or server-side rendering. So people are really holding each other back, and it's also happening in JavaScript, I think. Like it's happening in any uh, uh, developer community we have right now. So some people are really advanced in a specific area of technology, right? Nobody's born an NPM celebrity genius. It's just a lot of practice. So we sometimes forget that other people don't have our years of experience. So when we give them advice on what to do, like chain these commands together, it doesn't really give them anything but a stack overflow, like it's nothing more than a stack overflow answer to them. Another thing which is kind of weird is this not invented here syndrome, because I don't think that's ever a helpful thing to say to somebody, because at best it's not true, at worst it's really insulting. If I think back, the times I learned the most is when I built things I already knew, because I already understood the problem space and I could write a better solution in order to understand how they're solving a problem. Okay, so before we continue with applying some new ideas to fix all problems, so we've looked at these big old things we rely on every day, the terminals, file systems, and some Unix principles, but now we need to get a bit more concrete and apply some ground rules for JavaScript first. So when I'm saying modules, um, I'm, I mean proper modularity. So we're using CommonJS modules or ES6 modules everywhere. We're not putting things into the global scope by adding script tags in the head or something. Um, also, I don't think the current set of tools is broken. The industry is obviously able to ship things. But all these tools have something in common. You can run them from the terminal and they move files around. So we need to recover from our decades-long Stockholm Syndrome, I think, starting with version control. Switch topic branches, git reset, realize I hadn't committed or stashed, goodbye 1,000 line patch. Patrick is working on Rust at Mozilla. I'd say he knows what he's doing. But it doesn't mean he's magically protected from making those kinds of mistakes. Like how people are suggesting commands, further commands to fix this. It's like here's some more crack. Another one. And last a couple of hours, thanks to get it reset hard. Make sure to stage any temporary work. Now Tim really, I mean really knows how Git works. He has basically written, rewritten the entirety of Git in, uh, Git in JavaScript. And Sometime after this happened, he also started working on an editor that auto-stages local changes. So he was kind of using Git um, as a local, um, like he had a branch for everything you typed, so you couldn't lose it. And here's another funny thing I sometimes catch myself doing, and I call it the under redo history maneuver. So, Suddenly your code doesn't work anymore, and you know you wrote something a few minutes ago, and back then it still worked. So you carefully go back in time by punching undo, and you copy it, and you carefully redo to the present, and you paste it back in, and then it works again. But women, Emacs have an undo tree. Everything is safe. You know Cthulhu? 
So I think having an under tree is a great concept, but what happens if your editor is closed or crashes? Unless you configured something to save the under tree somewhere, which I don't know how it works, um, your history is gone again. It's not persisted to a persistent database or something, and it's not shared with other people, so it's really gone. And it's not available outside of the editor, so you couldn't use, make use of your typing history and like, create interesting visualizations with it. Okay, so another thing. I love asking that question or being asked that question. Have you pushed that change? Many of us are reluctant to share things we don't consider done. Let me ask you, whatever is considered done in software development? We're reluctant because comets have this weird finality to them. Like, as if what happens in master stays in master, and you can never change that. So if we had this undo history, undo redo history, and we would publish it to other people, I think it would be really cool if I could let others see what I'm working on right at the moment. So it works sort of like Google Docs, but it's for code and it's integrated into my editor and I have all the tools I'm used to. So here's a comment from the fantastic React router project. Why is the comment message rendered in monospace? It would make sense to have a richer text format for this, like Markdown, I think. So what if we take code and we see it as data instead of a byte stream and we put it into a database? First, we have to go back to the file system, though. File system is a very low-level abstraction. And as I said, I think it's too low-level for storing code, even if you have Git to kind of manage the insanity. But it exists, and it won't really change. So what can we do? Well, as we already said, we put a high level of abstraction on top of it. And that, that abstraction is really simple. A universal log of changes. So what if I put every change I make to code into a log, a linear history of diffs? It records every key press, every paste, every undo, every redo. So it kind of captures the intent I was making at that point in time and remembers it. So the way Git works is by storing snapshots. So when you enter Git log, it's not actually ch showing you a list of changes that they saved on disk. It's computing changes and then rendering them to you. But I think a log is way more powerful an abstraction than a history of snapshots. Because if we need a specific version of a module, we can just compute the snapshot by following the log from the beginning to the version we desire. And most operational transform storage backends, like in Google Docs, actually work exactly that way. OK, so you might think, what about the storage requirements for this? Saving a lot of plain text diffs is a, is a problem. But I don't think that's actually true. Like, repetitive symbols are just going to be gzipped away. And storing things in a cloud is cheap and reliable. So if you run out of disk space, you can just put it somewhere else. So, of course, we probably wouldn't put binaries into this, and bin big binaries are also still a problem for Git. So I would not save binary data in this log. It would just, I would put it into a good old blob store, and we save a reference to it in our log. Cool. Uh, next topic for me is naming things. So many things have names in programming, right? Like when I create a new project, I need to decide for a name. And then I go in the folder, and the first file I can just call index.js. Thank you, common.js. And then I need to name, start naming functions and types. And then I need to name local variables all over the place. So that's an, a UUID version 4, the completely random kind. And it's how I named my slideshow folder for some reason. Uh, we're often using strings when we should use unique IDs, I think. Because we change our minds about things, but the names are also the IDs. So when we move things, when we, when we change our mind about how we name something or what it's part of, 
that doesn't cause any problems. If we move or rename things, we shouldn't have to update any references. Meaning computers, when talking to each other, should always use IDs, not names. Names are for humans, IDs are for computers. The problem right now is you can't just move or rename things. If you move a local module in your project, you break the relative require statements. So I would say you move something from lib slash foo slash bar dot js, and it says require dot dot slash dot dot slash dot dot slash something, it's just going to break for no good reason. If someone renames a package, it's going to break other people's require statements, or it inserts funny warning messages, like when the 6 to 5 project renamed itself to Babel two weeks ago. And if you rename something within a module, it creates undefined references. Like, now there's tools for this, like TurnJS by Marijn Haverbecke, but not really many people are using those. So I clearly think that UUIDs are better than names, like string names. So what if everything had unique identifiers? It means that names could really freely change without breaking any references. And that in turn means that code and entire projects could be reorganized effortlessly. Like you can move folders around, you can move files around, um, as long as everything is inherently tied to, to IDs, that shouldn't be a problem because we're not using the names anymore, right? Okay, so next topic is dependency management, which is a huge topic. And it's something NPM is already quite good at, at least compared to others. It's actually unusual that you can have more than one version of a package in a given dependency tree. In Ruby, for example, you can only have one version of a gem within one running project. Uh, one process. Right, but in JavaScript, I think I use some lodash function in just about every module I've written. And when writing user interfaces, every module I write explicitly requires React. So, and, but usually when code is repeated all over the place, it's a code smell, right? So if all our module headers look exactly the same, why, it's not a, why isn't it a code smell for us? Because we can't do anything about it. Okay, so what if dependency information lived in a database instead of package JSON, which is a file on the disk on the file system? So this is the output of npm info React. It's npm's view. In npm's view, package JSON already is a database. So we got a list of versions here. We got a list of when the versions were created. We got a list of maintainers, and a bunch of other useful metadata. If you publish a new version to NPM, you just create a new record in their database, a new version of your package in their database. So in some way, I would say it's actually natural to bring the client side and the server side together, that being the NPM client and how it manages things locally and the NPM registry. Cool, so dependencies obviously need to be kept up to date. And there's a bunch of reasons to do this, like security fixes, for example. The Node security project regularly finds exploits in popular packages, which you really should update quickly. And then there's free performance updates, like Lodash version 3 introduced changes to the way they're doing things internally, and they could uh, basically lazily apply transformations to save time and memory for you without you having to change any code, which is great, I think. And then there's also, you know, when a package is being updated and it has new features, you want to leverage those new features when they come out. And last but not least, you want to profit from bug fixes, of course. Okay, so we get to the last topic. The user experience of programming. So packages have no built-in learning interface. We rely on packages having a readme, an API documentation, examples, or tests. If one of these is not available, we need to go start looking into the source code, which is usually not the best first exposure experience with any, anyone's code. And we need all of this to understand how we can use a package. 
So what if README docs, examples, and tests were more unified, like more presented as a coherent whole, more designed? I think Swift playgrounds are pretty cool. There's a way you, to enter code. The code is being evaluated line by line instantly. There's certain types of values like numbers and images which can be visualized more naturally. So what happens if we make it more natural to write tests and documentation? Like if we had a better design interface to write tests and documentation, would it actually result in better documentation? Would it result in better test coverage? Interfaces really matter, I think, right? We're always looking for new, better things to improve our lives. We're not burdened by the same preconceptions for non-programming stuff like we are for programming tools. I mean, who the hell wants a terminal interface for calling a cab? Which would actually be kind of cool, but we're, we're really delighted by good designs as human beings. So, to conclude, I, I want to say we need a tool to create better tools. And it needs to be minimal. It should not look at like an IDE. It needs to be open, and it should really be fun to use. And we need people to help us with that. Thank you. <laughs>